Let's examine dipole-dipole interaction in detail. Imagine we have two molecules, and we'll represent them just as dipoles, because that's really the only aspect of the molecules we're interested in. And we'll imagine one has a dipole moment m1, one has a dipole moment m2, represented by the lengths of those vectors. And we'll draw a line going down the center-to-center connection between those two molecules. And we can see that with dipoles, there's actually a couple different angles we need to, several different angles we need to use to represent the orientation of those dipoles to one another. First, we're going to have an angle theta 1, which represents basically how this vector is arrayed with regard to this line of approach between the vectors. And similarly, we're going to have a, a theta 2, We need to use several angles to show how these dipoles are arrayed with, re with respect to each other. So let's draw them in. First, we need a theta 1, which represents how this angle is, uh, how this dipole is arrayed with respect to this line going between the two molecules. And another angle, theta 2, for the second molecule. But even if both molecules were uh, say perpendicular to that dashed line, we wouldn't know how they were arrayed on the third dimension uh, out of the plane of the board. So we'll draw that with another angle we'll call phi. So imagine we have these two vectors representing the two molecules. So the first angle, theta 1, is this angle along the line of approach. The second angle, theta 2, is also along the line of approach. But the third angle, phi, is this angle, the angle that is perpendicular to the line of approach. So you see we have to represent this dihedral angle as well as the angles theta 1 and theta 2. So we can see the potential energy of interaction between these two molecules is a function of the distance between them, r1, 2. But it's also a function of uh, the magnitude of each of their dipole moments, the dielectric constant of the medium that separates them, and also all these angles, theta 1, theta 2, and phi. If we examine this geometrical factor on the right-hand side, we can see it's a function purely of the orientation of the dipoles. And if we examine the different possibilities for the arrangement of the two dipoles, we can see we can have parallel, anti-parallel, we can have head-to-tail, we can also have head-to-head. -head. And you can imagine that this is going to be repulsive, this is going to be repulsive, these two will be attractive because we have the positive bits and the negative bits of the molecules close to one another. And if we actually look at the numerical factor for these limiting cases, we can see the value is going to be negative 1, positive 1, positive 2, and negative 2. And because we have a, already have a negative sign in the expression, this means that the ones that are positive here are going to be attractive. In other words, a negative potential energy. If we calculate the value of the potential energy between two molecules and uh, plug in realistic values for all the parameters, what we find is that the potential energy of attraction for dipole-dipole is less than thermal energy, which means that the molecules won't be locked into place. Random thermal motions will be enough to knock them out of alignment. And so while we will see uh, a bias towards conformations that are attractive and a bias against conformations that are repulsive, we're going to see, we're going to see molecules uh, basically 
undergoing some sort of hindered rotation, and uh, in other words, molecules are rotating in the gas and liquid phase. It's just that there's a bias towards having their a slight bias towards having the molecules lined up. So what that means is that if we're trying to figure out the average interaction, we have to take a weighted average that's weighted towards the molecules with the lower potential energy, that is the molecules that are lined up. So we take the expression for the potential energy, which we said was a function of theta one, theta two, and phi, and we average over all angles. And it's actually a Boltzmann weighted average. So we do a weighted average by integrating over all the angles, including a weighting factor. And the weighting factor takes into account that uh, more favorable orientations are going to be present in greater amount than less favorable orientations. And the result of that average is shown on the next slide. The result is the Kiesem energy shown here. We can examine this equation and see a couple of things that are interesting. First of all, note that the dipole moments are factored as squares. If we compare to the original equation for a specific pair of dipoles at a specific angle, we can see that it's linear in each dipole moment. So why is it squared in the Kiesem interaction? Well, in the Kiesem interaction, the stronger a dipole moment is, the more it can align the other dipole to be aligned with it, which is going to strengthen the interaction. So it's actually factored in twice, and the same argument can be made for the second dipole. A similar argument explains why the dielectric constant ends up being squared, because the stronger the dielectric, the weaker the orientational effect, and of course, not just are the molecules less oriented, but then their interaction is also weaker, so we've got that squared. In a similar argument, the exponent has become doubled. So in the original uh, equation, we can see that this was r to the third for a particular set of dipoles at a particular uh, set of angles. When we look at the angle average expression, it's now not r to the third, but r to the sixth. And that's true whenever we do angle averaging. Finally, we can see why the KT thermal energy is in the bottom of this expression. This makes sense because we know that if thermal energy were to go to infinity, the molecules would not be oriented at all. They'd be just as likely to be in a repulsive uh, orientation as an attractive interaction, and so all the interaction potentials would sum to zero. On the other hand, if we went to a temperature of zero, the molecules would all be in their lowest energy state. In other words, they'd all be perfectly aligned. If all the molecules were aligned, uh, that would make a very strong interaction. Now notice this, the equation does blow up. If we say a temperature of zero, the energy goes to infinity. However, that's not physical because remember the Kiesem interaction is angle averaged. So the derivation is done assuming that the molecules are not locked into a particular interaction.